Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger. We don't have Brian Broom today, but today we'll be talking about chronology, community, and freedom. We'll start with the French Revolution and the Cambodian genocide and the practice and function of chronology and history in society. So on the 22nd of September, 1792, French revolutionaries declared the dawn of a new age. They would no longer count years starting with the coming of Christ, Anno Domini, but from the abolition of the monarchy. The first year of the Republic, which would give way shortly to the reign of terror, would be reckoned year one of French history. That lasted until Napoleon. Not very long. But in a similar bid for power over history, Paul Potts Khmer Rouge declared their year zero in April 1975 as they instituted a, pro- instituted a program of agrarian Marxism and what they called the purification of the populace, the Cambodian genocide. George Orwell and Aldous Huxley both noted the significance of historical chronology in their dystopian novels 1984 and Brave New World, both published in the first half of the 20th century before the Cambodian genocide. In 1984, the protagonist realizes that he does not know the exact year or the year of his birth. Quote, it was never possible nowadays to pin down any date within a year or two, close quote. In Brave New World, the date is reckoned from the invention of the Marl T. Ford. So Greg, why does this theme crop up in history and in fiction? What, what is it that the French and Cambodian revolutionaries were after? And what was it that Orwell and Huxley picked up on? You know what the most unpopular book in the Bible is? Except, well, maybe for Leviticus. Numbers. (laughs) (laughs) I'll give you that. And after that? After that. um, Think of the first nine chapters. The first nine chapters of Chronicles, which is what I read today. Oh, good for you. Not all nine at once. (laughs) (laughs) The last few of the first nine. Most people who read the Bible want to know why all of these genealogies are there. And are they really important? And am I sinning if I skip over them when I read the Bible? (laughs) I, I don't know that it's sin. It's understandable, at least. But if that implies that somehow they're unimportant to Christianity, then you do have to step back and say, why God put all that there? God God deals in passing time that's numbered. And of course, we see it in Genesis 1. God counts the days off. Now, because there's only seven of them, we don't get too terribly bored. <laughs> but I wonder how many, how much the evangelical Christian the people how many could actually tell you what God created on each day? God mm-hmm. thought it important enough to slow down and tell us. Maybe there's significance to that. And then when we get beyond the fall, he gives us uh, genealogy and chronology leading from Adam to Noah. And then after the flood from Noah to Terah, which is Abraham. Then we start, at uh, Father Abraham, then we start getting uh, summaries 430 years, Paul says, from the promise to the law. 490 years from the the Exodus to Solomon's temple. Then we have all the regnal dates for the kings of Israel and Judah. And anyone who hasn't, who's been a Christian for any length of time, probably needs to go through and, and see that for themselves and draw it out. God thought it was important. And even when you walk through the life of Christ and then later specifically through the book of Acts, the same kind of thing keeps showing up. There's a constant attention to how many days did this take? Or was it the Mm. next week or the next festival, which any good Jew would know from looking at a calendar. Mm -hmm. The Bible is structured as something that reaches from zero to 4,000 a.m., 4,000 in terms of the years of the world and on Monday. And everything fits in there in sequence. And God did this deliberately because it kind of matters to the way he reveals things. God reveals things in the context of history and geography. Now, we started talking about this last time, so we're going to talk some more about it. But back to your original question, then, why is it that um, the Marxists and the French socialists and the revolution and Huxley and Orwell had this this fascination with restarting the calendar. Well, that's what gods do, isn't it? 
If you're going to redefine all of society, one of the most basic things you do is reckon that it all began with you. Hmm. We reckon forward from from here. Now, to a certain degree, we all do this. We 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 celebrate birthdays every year. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, it matters if I'm ten or if I'm forty. Yeah, probably it actually does. And if you're just reckoning for yourself, that's great. But when you start wanting everyone in the world to reckon their timelines from your birthday, I think that's egomania <laughs> or God complex. And when uh, the Khmer Rouge in, um, in Cambodia and when the, when the French revolutionaries wanted to reset the calendar for their nation and, and ultimately for the world, that was their vision. They were saying something about their ability to order the cosmos and to define its history from that point forward. Everything else could be rejected. Everything else was unimportant. Everything that went before is trash. Creation begins here. And we are going to give you this wonderful millennium, communist paradise, new world order, call it what you will, this uh, world state, this brave new world, where everything will be so much better but in order to make sure that works, you really do need to forget about everything before. Mm -hmm. Obvious reasons? You might compare what we're giving you to what you had and <laughs> find it lacking. You know the old joke about what socialist countries used before they had candles? No, I've heard it, but I don't remember the, the punchline. Electricity. Oh. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Indeed. So is there something about claiming the power of regeneration here is that yeah you're, you're starting the new the kingdom come as it were you're ushering in the world to come that's brand new and everything before is passed away you've brought in the new i mean that's a godlike power to that's, be claiming that's, that's that's exactly what's going on here um the old pagan world had its chaos festivals as as history cycled through through ever ending cycles, uh, it would plunge down into chaos, and for a day or a season through a festival, the civilization the ordered civilization would throw off all restraint and indulge its wildest, most perverse fantasies and desires, and out of that chaos would be born their new world. We we, we descend from gold to silver to to iron to or brass to iron to chaos, and then poof, we're starting the cycle over with a new age of gold. Mm. Uh, it was considered a, a function of the way the universe worked because, of course, the pagan world didn't like the idea of linear time. A line has a beginning and an end. History would then have a creator and a, a judgment day. Well, Christianity has exercised a strong influence on the Western world, even on Marxism. Some have mm. called Marxism a, a Christian heresy in that it uses a lot of Christian thought forms and words like love, compassion, freedom, liberty, to push forward its agenda. And one thing that it most certainly adopted was a linear view of history. Despite the fact that within history, it maintained the ideas of cycles as each old order falls into um, social conflict, the struggle of the proletariat with the capitalist. And then through blood, bloody re revolution, we make the next transition but yet there, there is progress. There's an upward progress. It's post-millennial in that sense. Uh, we're climbing out of the, the original chaos and from primitive communism into a more advanced form at the end of the age where everybody will love everybody and everybody will share and everybody will be nice and it will stay that way until, as Lewis says, the moon falls or the sun grows cold. But that's they're, they're, they're stealing and they know they're stealing so they want to eliminate any concept of a Christian calendar. Now, for a very long time, I, I don't have the exact date as to when we started doing the BCAD thing, but we've been doing that a long time. It was it was in the, you know, originally uh, everyone in the empire reckoned, reckoned time in terms of so and such and such year of such and such emperor. But at some point, some monks said, well, wait a minute, well, there, there's, there's a more important emperor. There's a heavenly emperor. Mm -hmm. There's another king on Jesus. And it is best to estimate Jesus' birth and missed by a few years. But ever since then, everything after that date became Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. Not the time since 
Jesus came, but the year of mm-hmm. his reign. Yeah. Whereas BC eventually adopted, at least in English speaking countries, before Christ, that is before his incarnation, before his birth. So when you start signing your documents or, or, or doing your research and you start labeling things BC and AD, you are making some profound claims. Uh, and and even though for many it became a mere formality, there were there was enough in humanism to say that's a formality we really don't like. <laughs> you're you're saying that Jesus was the Christ, the prophesied Jewish Messiah, that all of history leads up to him. We're not happy with that. And you're saying furthermore that he is the reigning king over the whole planet, over the whole universe, that he's still reigning, and he's our Lord. He's both God and King. Yeah, we're not happy with that. So we're going to reinvent a dating system. Now, unlike the French revolutionists, they didn't say, scratch everything, let's start with some hypothetical zero, because <laughs> that'd be really hard. Let's go back to the 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 evolution of uh, man. <laughs> Okay, so we're so we're living in the year, you know, five million. That's eh, not helpful. Christian civilization was all, already placed upon the, a heavy burden that, for a couple thousand years, we've all been writing this way and going back and changing it is really hard. So we'll just change the the abbreviations. We'll call it CE for Common Era, and BCE before the Common Era, because it's just common. We're not going to talk about what <laughs> makes it common. No one's going to notice that this common era just happens to be that inaugurated by the coming of Jesus into the world. But it's it's the best they could do. And so there you go. The, um, I don't know if I have this in my notes, but I think I do. Oh, yeah. The Southern Baptist Convention in June of 2000 actually passed a resolution denouncing the shift to uh, CE and BCE. They said that it was... Um, that this new shift was the result of secularization, anti-supernaturalism, religious pluralism, and political the political correctness pervasive in our society. So even timekeeping is a religious occupation, a religious mm-hmm. calling. Mm-hmm. To, to go back to a metaphor that we both love a lot, story. Mm-hmm. Stories have a beginning, they have a progression, and they have an end. If you go to the back of the Lord of the Rings, of the final book, Tolkien, long before anybody else got to it, himself laid down the chronology for Middle Earth from Mm -hmm. the creation of the world by Lubitar down through the end of the Third Age with the War of the Ring and what what follows into the Fourth Age. And some of it's a little little vague in places, but by and large, it's it's pretty detailed and pretty consistent, especially as we get um, to the destruction of Numenor and beyond. I think it's interesting that he doesn't to lend an air of realism, mm. uh, just leave gaps to say, well, clearly it's it's a whole world. We couldn't possibly know the entire timeline. Yeah. I think he asserts something very important in the fact that he even laid down a comprehensive timeline. Yeah, because he was uh, open, at the very least, to theistic, theistic evolution, there are a few places where he says, and unmeasured ages pass, because nothing really was <laughs> happening as far as the storyline was concerned. But uh, once once man arrives on the uh, the scene, once men come out of the East, uh, or the uh, the firstborn, the elves arrive, then it's he doesn't leave any gaps after that. Mm-hmm. It's year. It's at some point it is year by year, and at some point as we get closer to the War of the Ring, it's months by months. And and I once looked up a, a site for Jane Austen and found that somebody's done the, the same kind of thing for Pride and Prejudice and probably for the other Austen novels, so that we can keep track of things. I've seen um, some commentary on Lewis's That Hideous Strength that criticizes it at points because he lost count of the days. <laughs> and, and and a letter will say, you know, on August the 3rd, and he, no, that couldn't possibly have been August the 3rd because you know, people are indeed that picky. <laughs> you know, and then you can go to the comic book universes. And uh, for a while, they tried to maintain some kind of chronolo- chronology to the whole thing. And eventually they said, yeah, with our stories coming out once a month, 
there's no way that these are keeping track with actual time. Yeah, that'd be so, tricky. <laughs> <laughs> I remember reading one response uh, from a letter to the editor that said, uh, okay, so we're, we're saying that Superman's always about 29. So, and then since he's in the present, Superboy lived about, uh, yeah, 10, 15 years before that. So wherever you are, look back that far. And there's always been, in comic book fans, I think a certain... Uh, what? <laughs> and both uh, DC at least collapsed its universe a couple times to try to update things. But mm. but we, we it is natural as humans. We live and move in the universe of triple continuity. We want to know when did this happen? How long did this take? It's key to storytelling. Yeah. We even see that in the earliest Greek plays that they happen within real time. Yeah. There's no metaphor of time passing. It's just what you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. Leave it to Shakespeare to, to sort of monkey with that one. And give us, <laughs> yeah, years pass. And but... the twins have grown up and lost contact. <laughs> yeah. So that, that this idea of chronology, as it does in Scripture, shows us narrative and opens the possibility for story. If X follows, or if Y follows X, then X can have caused why it can have set things in motion that caused why but if it's the other way around then that's not possible temporal causation depends upon temporal order and so and i've done i think i did this last week but I, and i've certainly done it lots and lots of times so let me do it with princess bride this time so the man in black had been mostly dead all day but this was going to be a challenge of wits the princess was uh, Princess Buttercup was about to commit suicide, uh, but the farm boy said that he loved her and was going to go away and become and then seek his fortune. Uh, but the dead pirate Roberts was actually retired and living in Bermuda or someplace. Um, at which point, uh, the giant threw a rock at Wesley. I mean, anybody who knows the movie will say, "Okay, I recognize those scenes. That's not a story. That's not what happened." They have to be put in the right order. I, in other contexts, um, I don't remember if it comes up in this series any place, but there used to be a TV series called Xena, Princess Warrior. Anybody remember <laughs> that one? You, vaguely. Vaguely? Ever so vaguely. Yeah, you, yeah, there's no reason for you to see it. She was um, <laughs> living in mythical times, and there's your key right there. Uh, and so in her various adventures, she encountered, aside from the some of the Greek gods and such, uh, she encountered Julius Caesar. She encountered the heroes of the Trojan War returning home. And she encountered Joseph and Mary and a baby leaving Bethlehem without any time skipping. One of these things is not like the others. <laughs> <laughs> One of these things just doesn't belong temporally. But the, the series... Uh, expected everyone to be comfortable with the idea that these all happened in mythological times and mythological times contract like a rubber ruler. <laughs> they, they, they can stretch, they can come and go. And, you know, it's a good story. No one really cares that much, which you've heard many times by raves about Bible people, Bible times, Bible stories, <laughs> Bible lands, by which people mean generally some fairy tale kind of existence where all Bible stories fit in no particular order. And one of my great complaints against Sunday school in general, well, it's not true of all by any means, is the tendency of teachers just to tell stories. What is the story for this week? Mm. And often they're sorted by moral lesson rather than the way the Bible sorts them, which is in chronological order, beginning with creation and reaching to Christ. And so children simply know that all of these things happened. There was David and Goliath, and there was Noah and the ark, and there was Samson, and there was Adam, and there was Jesus walking in the water. But if you ask the average uh, kid in Sunday school, okay, what order did these things happen in? They'll probably give you a blank look. Like, I don't know what you, first of all, I don't know what you mean by that. You mean what order did the teacher tell them? No, this is these things really happen in the real world, and one followed the other. I no one never told us that, and so the whole of Old Testament gets thrown into this Bible times kind of thing, 
by which, of course, we mean the first 4,000 years of human history <laughs> out of a possible six. It, it's ridiculous. And, and yet there it, and yet here we are. Uh, we, we don't know God's story because we don't have a chronology and we don't have an order of things. We don't have a narrative. And without narrative, there is no story. Mm -hmm. To apply it again to Lord of the Rings, it kind of matters whether Frodo goes to Mount Doom before or after Bilbo finds the ring. Mm -hmm. it, you, you turn it the other way around, nothing makes any sense. And it sort of matters in, in uh, Pride and Prejudice whether or not Jane despises Darcy before her or after her sister runs off with a cat the whole storyline and and here's the next thing the whole meaning is altered mm -hmm. so although chronology does not produce narrative you need a little bit more to have a narrative than a system an ordered series of events you can't have narrative without it and you can't have story without narrative and if there's no story it's hard to find meaning you can you can try for something very abstract you can try for definitions that float in the void. Well, what is a universal and what is a particular? Uh, you can try to do that with God. Well, in what sense is God three? In what sense is God one? And yet God did not reveal himself in a book of systematics. He right. revealed himself in an ongoing storyline that reaches from Genesis to Revelation. And along the way, he tells us things about himself, but always in historical context. Always, It always arises out of the story he's telling and that God is three in one does not become fully clear. It's implied and it's true all the time, but it does not become fully clear until Jesus rises from the dead, declared to be the Son of God with power by the according to the resurrection, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So when we start ta attacking chronology, we're gutting sequence, we're gutting narrative, we're gutting story, and we're gutting meaning. And once we've done that, then we can go back and try to insert a new chronology with a new, which is going to yield a new meaning for what has happened. The alternative of no chronology means everything happened at once. Everything happened in Bible <laughs> times or mythological times or modern times or whatever. Or back in the day, Dad, I've always wondered what day that was. <laughs> found myself actually using it the other time, the other day. But it, it, it all becomes vague. And so we abandon history for social studies. History is about a story. At least it's supposed to be. But if we reduce it to only chronology, then we get the, the standard complaint. Well, you're just giving us names and, and dates, and that's boring. Well, of course that's boring. Because <laughs> that's the skeleton. That's not the yeah. flesh and the organs and the life. But try pulling a skeleton out of a living person and see how far he goes and how interesting <laughs> he is to talk to. You know, there, there, there are some problems there. Mm -hmm. But um, we can do better than that. We can have the chronology and we can, we can get a sense of narrative. And then we can begin to understand the story and the meaning of all of these things. And one of the complaints that history teachers get or that the educational community raises is, Nobody can memorize all this. It's so boring that it's not going to stick in anybody's head. Well, I grew up memorizing dates as a matter of course. It never occurred to me to question my teacher on this. It just seemed like a fun and obvious thing to do. Of course, I have a pretty good memory for such things or did when I was younger. Um, but if we turn and look at, oh, let's pick the, the universe we haven't talked about, Star Wars. <laughs> There's an entire sequence in chronology here. We, My wife and I found ourselves watching The Mandalorian, because one of our friends recommended it. It's, it's a nice little set of, of short stories. Uh, but one of our first questions was, when does this take place? Mm -hmm. Because it matters. Yeah. Here's this strange little kid with green skin and big ears. It matters whether or not this is set before or after the original trilogy, because if it's before, this could be Yoda growing up. If it's after, it obviously isn't. Uh, and there are other things like that. And as we we ran we run into things as we watch the series, we we still for a little while we're okay. Now when is this exactly? Okay, so that can't be that. It can't be that because chronology doesn't allow it. Mm -hmm. Do you think the average teenager or, or young kid who watches the Star Wars universe? 
has it sorted out? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. They've sorted out Middle Earth and all of its four ages. They've sorted out the, the, the continuity of the DC and Marvel universes in both their comic book and their cinematic versions. Mm-hmm. They can tell you exactly when Captain Marvel first met Nick Fury. <laughs> and why she is where she's likely has been there for because if she didn't meet him then then what's she doing here in this movie at this time and the average kid's fine with this in fact they they delight in this many many start delving into these things to try to make these comparisons and connections because being human beings they're people of order but first they got to be interested mm-hmm. first they got to like the story they got to like the characters they have to, there has to be something interesting in, in, in the theme and in the telling so that then once they get into it, then they start doing the sorting, uh, both in time and geography with Star Wars. Which planet is he from? What is that race noted for? What is their chief agricultural product? What kind of star technology do they, it just it <laughs> starts coming. Makes uh, me think of Galaxy Quest. Do you remember that one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Talking about an entire race that took on a sci-fi series way too seriously. But, <laughs> well, I was uh, thinking of the kids who have oh, yeah, oh, studied the yes. show so extensively that the actors who are now living the real life right. show have to call them and say, wait, how does the ship work? I need yeah. to fix it. <laughs> yeah. How do I? Okay. Tell me, do I turn left or right in this, in this air duct? Guide me. <laughs> Okay. Oh, I knew it was all real. <laughs> they pull <laughs> yeah. up their plans over the for the, for the starship. The yeah. Yeah. It, it, the problem here is not with teaching kids history. The problem is finding why history is important. Why it's important to them. And once we understand that this is God's universe, we're all the image of God, and that He has a story that is the most brilliant thing ever, with all kinds of twists and turns and high points and low points and heroes and violence and giants and dwarfs and witches, dragons and true Kidnapping, love. Kidnapping, torture, revenge. Exactly. True love. Then they're going to enjoy it. But if it's all cut up and segmented and nothing matches anything else, then yeah, I can see how it would be boring. And how history since the Bible closed would be boring. You, you, they, they need to see the storyline. Uh, a Christian historian, who unfortunately his name is gone from me, not because he's not well known, was not known well, well known in his field because I'm just blanking. He wrote uh, a <laughs> blank on that too. It's a red book. It's, uh, it's something about studies. A theological interpretation of American history. Greg Singer is his name. See Greg mm-hmm. Singer. He attended a uh, conference of, of historians where some of the, the best and brightest of that time, I guess this probably would have been the 60s, early 70s, were all in attendance, you know, giving great lectures on this and that about the philosophy of history, the details of history. And as he heard people talking, he kind of wandered into the group and said, so guys, experts all, why is it exactly we teach history? And they had all been saying, um, well, you know, history doesn't really mean anything. There's no point to it. There's no interpretive principle. It's just whatever. And when he said, okay, so why are we requiring it of undergraduates and high school students? They had no answer. Somewhere I came across an answer from a historian. I don't have it up on my screen. It's for its work for another book at another time. Mm-hmm. But he basically said, well, it gets you, you get to know yourself by knowing other people. There are interesting stories you can share. And he just went through all kinds of things that were true enough, but you could get elsewhere or you really didn't have to get it all. And there's certainly better ways of getting them than requiring history 1A, 1B, and 17A and B, you know, two, two full years or even one full year of, of historical studies. And so with that in mind, the school system has moved away from history to sociology, where we study the broad principles that are timeless, that involve no chronology. And occasionally we, we may pull a story out of history to illustrate a principle. And because we're boring them with our charts and diagrams, and maybe this will help them pay attention a little better, you think. But we, we, we don't teach history anymore. And... Um, the generation probably just before mine kind of looked at this whole thing and scratched their head and said, well, the educators must know what they're doing, but I don't get any of this. 
And so there was a true, another factor in this generation gap where the older generation learned history, the younger generation did social studies and neither one understood the other. Because again, once you remove the history, you remove the story sooner or later. My, my wife has a great um, project she does with her junior high kids. So many of our, um, of our students um, come from Slavic families. And they're, if not their parents, their grandparents, or first generation immigrants. And so she sends them home to say, Grandma, Grandpa, why did you come to America? Mm. And the amazing thing to me is that they, the grandparents have not already told them, mm. but they haven't by and large. Maybe they just don't want to remember how horrible it was, or they're, they're bent on starting over. They don't want to talk about all that. But until the kids go home and say, what was your life like? Why did you leave? What was so important about coming here? Then they hear the stories and the kids are shocked. I had no idea. I had no idea what Russia was like, what the satellite countries were like. It's been buried. It's been lost because the families, the parents have not maintained the story. So story, chronology, narrative, story, meaning. You want to want to undermine God's meaning for your life, destroy the chronology of your life, your church, your nation, of Western civilization, of all history, and you will go around wondering who you are and why you're here and and what why your decisions matter. Where in the world is this all going? Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about, about your own perspective on learning history? I think it would be valuable. Well, <laughs> I am one of those people who got into history, I was a history major at Hillsdale, because I enjoyed it. Like the kid who gets into Star Wars because it's cool, that was me with history. It wasn't out of some grand knowledge of why we study history. It was because this is so interesting. Why would I not do this? What made it, what made it interesting for you? I think the people, the ability that you have to get to know someone mm without meeting them in person, that in the same way that knowing a new friend mm -hmm. and knowing who their friends are can give you context for them and your role in the friendship, friendship group, mm -hmm. I think learning, especially American history, was really enjoyable, like getting to know new friends is enjoyable. When did you start becoming enamored of history? Probably the beginning of college. The the first year at Hillsdale, you, in those days, you took Western Heritage first semester freshman year and American Heritage second semester freshman year. And then after that, you would take Western Heritage continued at some point if you wanted to major in history, along with several other classes and electives. Interesting point. Why did Hillsdale mm -hmm. call them heritage classes? <laughs> Because there's continuity and a story, um, they have the readers. You can buy them from their online bookstore, or if you go there, you can buy them from the physical bookstore. But they're collections of source documents, and they're chosen so that you can bring the story out of them. Mm -hmm. um, because that is the practice of history. It's not telling you, well, it it's telling you what happened, but it's doing so in a particular way, because as you, the historian, are practicing history, you are telling the story in the way that only you can, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> well, I think there's some things there to think about, but I appreciate mm -hmm. the you as a historian are telling the story as only you can. So does that mean there are dozens of versions of our history or hundreds or thousands? In a way, yes. Yes, in a way, yes, and absolutely. In another way, things that happened actually happened. You can't just make stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever happened, happened. Yeah. yeah. Is there that is, 1066? <laughs> there is a, there's a unity and, and yet a glorious mm -hmm. diversity as each person brings to the table things that he's discovered that may not be what someone else has discovered. Mm -hmm. I know when I'm teaching say American history, there are a number of things that I routinely hit, not because it's all I know, but because it's what I know best and what I think is most important, usually for young people or even adults to know right now. But my wife approaches a little bit differently. The man I learned 
history from initially, Pastor Powell, he emphasized some of the same things. Of course, I would echo him, but then he, <laughs> he had his own trends. Uh, our good friend David Farshman, when he's launching onto a tirade about history, usually it comes from a book he's, led, he's read lately and thoroughly mastered. So I always appreciate listening to him lecture about history. Even And of course, he does this even to his math students. One of his uh, favorite lectures is um, he, 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 wants, he wants to explain taking square roots of X or X squared using the figure of the Berlin Wall. I'll let you figure out how that works. But he discovered really early on that his college students in calculus or in advanced algebra did not know what the Berlin Wall was. And so he found himself going back to the 1700s, explaining the creation of, <laughs> of nation states, the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, World War I, World War II, the rise of Marxism, in order to explain why there was a wall in Berlin and why people got shot if they crossed it. Because if you have two axes trying to escape over the wall, two people trying to escape from uh, East Berlin, one of them is going to get shot and the other one's going to get to freedom. So anytime there's X times X under the wall, under the radical sign, only one comes out alive. He told all of history <laughs> to make that point. And one of his students, I'm, he told me, came up to him and said, I'm a history major. I have never had any of that explained Oof. to me. Oof. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, and here's math major, math teacher, math professor, explaining things in terms of history, which he expected people to get. Mm -hmm. but they don't. My own girls now are discovering all kinds of music, but I rarely got past um, World War II or the beginning of the Cold War with them in history classes. So the, the gap where this music is coming from, mm -hmm. they don't know that well. Yeah. And so well. now and, and so in, in order to place this recording artist, this band, this group, this trio, this quartet in its right place, they've had to fill in more and more history and more and more geography, particularly for America, had to learn about Bakersfield country, for instance. My family, my mom's family lived in Bakersfield mm -hmm. and were part of the migration during the Dust Bowl time. Oh, wait, more history. <laughs> part of our story. Mm -hmm. So e even, even understanding and appreciating pop music of various sorts, country, big band, the crooners, all of this has led them to, not, not with purposed intention, but just sort of, did this come before him or him? Was, it, when did, was this in the 60s? Was this mm -hmm. before or after the Beatles? You know, those, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Because they want to make sense of things. Mm -hmm. I, 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 will, I will now answer the question that I ask you. I got interested in history, I think, in about fourth grade, our little school library, and there wasn't much to it, had a group of, uh, of uh, historical fiction books. I did not know the name. Most of them had orange hardback covers. And so for the rest of my life, I called them the orange books. They were the stories of the childhood of famous Americans, which turns out was their real title, but I did not know that at the time. I just knew the <laughs> orange books. And they, they, they told the story of famous Americans in its beginning with their childhood, usually around junior high or so, up to their teen years. And then the last chapter would give a nod to what great things they did later in life. But they were written largely as adventure stories. They weren't all true by any means. They weren't just strictly speaking historical fiction, more with like fiction with a nod to history. But I enjoyed them no end, and I read every one of them. And that started me along the line. Then I came to Pastor Pout's history class and once we started doing timelines, I was all in. It was, here is a series of events. Oh, you just told us the history of Central Europe, particular Germany. Now you're going back and you're telling us the history of England along the same lines. And I would put the one timeline on the other. I remember one time saying aloud, oh, Cromwell comes next. And everyone looked at me, what? We're in Germany. <laughs> but it's the same time that, because <laughs> I naturally combined the timelines because they happened at the yeah, other contemporaneous. I spent the next many, many years looking for the orange books to buy. First of all, probably for myself, but then eventually when I got married and had children, I wanted them for my girls. 
And we looked high and low. We, I did not know they had a, a unified name and, and I would mention the bookstore owners and it really wasn't ringing bells. Mm. Largely because they kept saying orange books and they're not all orange and they exist now in paperback <laughs> versions that are red, white, and blue. Mm. But we were we went to Berkeley. I don't even remember why. And there was a big bookstore called Moe's. It's been there forever, apparently. Mm -hmm. And on this, this one shelf, I look up and I saw all of these orange books. One after another, like, <laughs> so, but no, I've got to be sure. I've got to be sure. I remember Paul Revere the best because I actually memorized some of Longfellow's poem, not mm -hmm. from a poetry book, but from the last chapter of that <laughs> book. So I pull it down shakingly and turn to the last couple of pages. And, yep, there it is. These are them. And then we proceeded to buy all of them, except those who were clearly Unitarians and I didn't want my girls reading about. Um, <laughs> no worse. We skipped uh, Woodrow Wilson, for instance. But then we went across the street to another bookstore and found two more. Like, why are these suddenly showing? <laughs> and ever since Never then, rains, but it pours. So next time, I would be able, I, I, I began to look for Childhood of Famous Americans, because that's what the series was called. And yeah, I gave them to my girls, and they were their favorites growing up. <laughs> Far beyond the uh, the landmark books, which are another historical Mm. series that should receive at least honorable mention. So when it comes to recommends, I'm going to come back to this and we'll talk about it a little bit more. But that's between these books and between school, uh, a fabulous storyteller for a uh, history storyteller for a teacher. By the time I was in seventh grade, if people asked me what I was going to do for a living, I said, well, either a lawyer, because I was watching a lot of Perry Mason in those days, <laughs> Or a history teacher. It's very specific. I never really wanted it to be anything else because that was the best thing possible. But when I got to college, I figured I can teach myself history. It's not that hard. I was already beginning to read it on my own. What can I teach myself and what do I think I, I might like? Oh, physics. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> no. um, but I've gone on to collect lots and lots of history books and mm. my family loves history. And not everyone's going to love it the same way that we do, but it is it is important to Christian tradition and the Christian world and life view. We, we think historically, we think chronologically, we think in terms of real people who really existed and whose actions and thoughts and words have left us a heritage that we must not forget. And I really appreciate uh, Hillsdale titling their courses American heritage, world heritage, because we're passing on ideas, beliefs, commitments, doctrines that people fought for, died for. Mm -hmm. And to forget all that and to try to reinvent the wheel in every generation, well, that's like setting the calendar to zero all over again. Mm -hmm. oh, this has been great. I really <laughs> like this topic and I've enjoyed this conversation very much. Do you have any recommendations? Well, I'm guessing I, some orange books, maybe. I'm going to recommend the orange books by and large. The series, I think it began in the 30s, and it was somewhat formulaic. I just ran across a, an article, a journal article on it. But it's uh, the language is pretty simple, uh, simpler than the landmark books, for instance. The characters are are all real Americans. There, there is a nice sampling of um, both male and female, although males predominate, of um, African-American, Native American, although again, the traditional white, Anglo-Saxon, Dutch, German, Italian, Spanish tradition probably predominates. But you can find, my, my, my girls found all kinds of characters they can identify with. Uh, my Emily's favorite is Annie Oakley, and for a long time after she read that book, that was her um, her handle on uh, all of her email and such. <laughs> they um, they come in hardback, uh, or they did. They're, not, they're no longer printed in hardback. They're printed in paperback now. I do not know to what degree they may have been re-edited in the um, 80s, 90s, and the, the 2000s. I would suspect that that's probably happened and that the older versions are probably better. The ones... But the characters are still well, well known, like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Betsy Ross. You can generally find those without a great deal of difficulty in a used bookstore. I couldn't find them because I didn't know the name and they didn't have the right color. 
I since have found a lot of them, and, and some of them are still um, still much are still in print as paperbacks. Hmm. They now extend up to car- historical characters I don't even recognize. I, I began losing it after Walt Disney and Neil Armstrong. <laughs> Um, some of the more modern characters, I, to, to me, they're not famous and I don't know, but, um, and I don't know with what perspective the modern writers are writing these things, but the older books by and large are wonderful. You may want to remind your kids that this is not exactly history that some of us make believe, mm-hmm. but I don't think that's going to bother them for a moment. And it will show them something of the wealth of the diversity of American history We'll show them how people in other times lived down to simple things like what they had for supper. <laughs> I remember learning in the book on Nathan Hale that in the Netherlands people put wagon wheels on their roofs so that storks could make nests yes. there. <laughs> the Wheel on the School is a wonderful novel about that. <laughs> oh, I didn't yeah. even know that. So anyway, um, if you have young children, I think it's a wonderful investment, but you may have to go online. If you can get it for, for around 6 $7, that's probably a good deal. If you find it less than that someplace, someone does not know what they have, buy it and apologize <laughs> later. Um, some, some of the books are so rare, though, that I haven't even been able to afford buying them. Uh, but yeah, there's my, my recommendation for today. Your comment about the the more recent historical figures reminds me of a paper I wrote in college about Civil War art, Hmm. that these painters wanted to paint in the grand historical style to which they had been accustomed. And, you know, then the news of the day, we could tell big stuff was happening in the Civil War, all these battles and things. Mm -hmm. Um, And there is an article called... Civil War paintings, or why are these paintings so terrible? <laughs> it's a wonderful little article. If you can find it, if you have JSTOR access or some kind of database access, do recommend. But it talks about how doing this kind of history through paintings was difficult because the fallout from these events hadn't yet happened. Mm. So the further distant you get from events, and I think this is true of written history as well, the easier it is to sort of see the scope of it. Mm. You know, something that you might have thought was real important yesterday, in 10 years you may have forgotten. So you have these great big paintings that these painters were churning out as fast as they could of events that really didn't have a lot of magnitude (laughs) in perspective. at the time. Yeah. As wonderful as that article is, that is not my recommendation. My recommendation is a memoir, uh, which may be slightly fictionalized, think along the lines of uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder's books, Um, but it's called Anything Can Happen. It's by George and Helen Papashvili. I think I may have butchered the pronunciation, um, but this is the story of a Georgian immigrant who comes to America and tries to navigate a new world, and it's wonderful. I can't summarize it to you it's a series of vignettes but i will tell you that i smiled all the way through this book (laughs) Um, and it's full of great value i'll just leave it at that and lots of smiles lots of smiles (laughs) thank you greg so much for this conversation thank you and we hope to see brian back next time yeah hope so thanks also to david our producer and my lawfully wedded husband Thank you to our listeners. Uh, We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, You can like our Facebook page if you want. Um, You can get in touch with us by sending us an email, haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. You can leave us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, if that's what the kids are calling it these days. Um, You can find our podcast anywhere podcasts are found. I always think it's so funny when people are like, you can find my book anywhere books are sold. And I'm like, mm, doubt oh, it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, but we are on Apple Podcasts and we are on Google Play or Google Podcasts, whatever they call that. We're on Spotify. We'll be around when you least yes. expect us. To find <laughs> us. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in. See you next time. Bye.